the court is now back in session. Without further ado, we would like to hand over to the counsels for Mr. Nunti to put some questions to the witness, should they wish. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, Your Honours. Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon, Mr. Witness. I am the international lawyer of Nuanchia, and I have some questions for you. Before the lunch break, Mr. Witness, the prosecutor, the gentleman who was asking questions to you, was reading to you an excerpt from your statement uh, about things that wives of Lon Nol soldiers told you in the period of the evacuation of Phnom Penh. Do you remember that this passage was read to you? At that time, I managed those uh, new evacuees, and they were placed into the cooperatives, and I learned of the fact uh, through them. And some people told me that their husbands were removed by Onka, and that's all they knew about the Onka. So then I asked them to uh, settle in the cooperatives, and we will be looking for the husbands. <laughs> that's all how I learned of that information. Mr. Witness, do you remember what exactly the wives of these soldiers were saying to you? They told me about their children and that their husbands uh, came with them, but halfway through they lost the husband. So they actually uh, talked about their family members and then I put them into the cooperatives. But I did not know the exact uh, number of uh, those uh, people. Do you remember who these women were that told you this? I already knew that uh, they came from Phnom Penh, but I cannot recall any other details. But other than that they were coming from Phnom Penh, did you know who they were? Did you know their names, for instance? No, I did not. And I cannot recall the names. Do you remember any names of 
the husbands that these wives were speaking about, the names of the soldiers. No, I cannot recall it. Do you remember when exactly it was that you spoke to these women? Which month? How many days after the liberation of Phnom Penh? There was a meeting at Popel Commune, and I cannot recall the date. The meeting was to receive those evacuees, so we uh, gave them food and uh, Khmer noodle, and we asked them how they had been, and we were. Uh, friendly with them, and there were a lot of them, so I cannot recall uh, the names. And after we organized the cooperatives, we placed them in the cooperatives, and we asked them to settle in the house with the roof made from the palm trees. So I met uh, a lot of them, but I cannot recall, recall the names of uh, anyone. Have you ever seen in your, your capacity, your official capacity, uh, lists with names of, of, of soldiers, or have you ever seen any document with these names confirming what the women had told you? No, I did not. You testified earlier this morning, Mr. Witness, that You were not personally involved in respect to whatever was happening to lone old soldiers. But nevertheless, you said yes to the question of the prosecutor that enemy officers were purged at in the instruction of Ankar. Now, my question to you is, can you explain to us how you know that these enemy officers were in fact purged. Who told you? Have you maybe seen it? Please enlighten us, Mr. Witness. I'd like to add that I did not witness it personally and I did not participate in that action. I only heard about it. It was a rumor from one person to another who whispered from one person to the next. That's how I learned about it. And that's how the, that kind of information uh, was uh, obtained to me. It was not a talk in, uh, in open, in the open. And if we did talk in the open, then we would also be taken away.
um, Mr. That's all I want to uh, tell you. Let me, if you allow me, Mr. Witness, go back to one sentence, or in fact two sentences, from the answer which was quoted from the statement this morning. In your statement at ERN number 00380135, you said that the phrase the military took out meant disappearance. So most of those women were widows. Please try to explain to us how you knew that these military disappeared and were killed. I did not witness the event uh, personally. I only received the, the families of the soldiers. But the question that we should ask, what happened to the husbands? Where did they go? That is a good question indeed. That is, that is a good question. President, uh, witness, please uh, wait until you see the red light on the microphone. Duty Council, can you raise the tip of the microphone a bit higher? Council, please put the question again. Mr. Witness, you raised yourself the question I should have asked you. Do you know what happened to these military? So I would be grateful if you could answer this question. Do you know what happened to them? Regarding the fate of those soldiers, I did not know. So when these women were telling you this, in your memory, it was still a rumor. Have you ever spoken to these same women much later? one year later, maybe two years later, so that you were able to find out if these men were still missing. No, I did not. Because uh, several months after that, I was relocated uh, to another place. So, Mr. Witness, please correct me if I'm wrong, but if I would like, if I summarize what you have been saying, it is that it was a rumor conveyed to you by the women that the Lonol soldiers were missing disappeared. Is that correct? Just a rumor.
not cloning from trauma. Yes, uh, regarding the disappearance, uh, that is correct. Mr. Witness, have you ever yourself been involved in executions, killing of enemies, be it internal or external? President and Duty Council, you may proceed. Duty Council, Mr. President, this question could incriminate the witness. President, Duty Council, you cannot respond on behalf of the witness. You need to consult with the witness. You are not a defense counsel. President, you may need to ask your client if he wishes to consult with you regarding this question. Witness, I uh, decline to respond to this question. And President, uh, Defense Counsel, please uh, move on, or you may need to refresh your question so that the witness can respond. Let me rephrase, Mr. Witness. Have you ever seen yourself executions of internal or external enemies? No, I did not uh, witness any killing in a person. And my, the nature of my work, uh, I already explained that this morning to the chamber, that is to resolve the situations regarding the living condition of the people. Mr. Witness, has anybody ever told you before 17 April 75 or after 17 April 75 that he or she executed enemies of the DK regime? No. Mr. Witness, earlier this morning, you were asked a question about confessions and about the red ink uh, from the notes on the confessions. And you also said that these confessions were not from 
from no soldiers, but rather from civilians. Is that correct? Young man. Yes, that is the case. Do you remember if there was any sp specific significance to the use of red ink? When mean no, it did not uh, mean uh, that way. It was in a usual uh, setting. Would it be fair to say that we, you, you were using red ink just because you had a red pencil or pen? If I choose a red ink pen, everybody could also choose a red ink pen. A red ink pen did not mean that somebody would be punished. It did not mean that way. So, just to be to be sure, nobody told you you have to use a red ink in certain circumstances. Is that correct? No, nobody told me that. Do you still remember, I realize it's a long time ago, but what the confessions of these civilians were about? What had these civilians confessed to? Do you remember? It was a, a minor issues. For example, for the buying and selling of uh, chicken eggs, and those people were arrested, and that happened in uh, Takao, and I requested uh, for them to be released. And those people, they were the, the sellers of chicken, ducks, and pigs, and uh, they were arrested uh, by the militia. So then I requested for their release, and then COM agreed to it, and the sector committee also agreed to it. Subsequently, they were released. Mr. Witness, would it be fair to say that these confessions from civilians that you were reading were mainly concerned with very small and minor offenses of these people? It is my understanding that they were minor mistakes and there were nothing serious about it. This morning, Mr. Witness, you were asked a question about internal enemies and external enemies. Would you be able to explain us one more time what in your memory the external enemies were? Who were they? External enemy refers to those enemy situated outside the liberated zones. And I actually stated that this morning. 
and the liberated zones at the time were around the Takai province. And so those people from Takai were called the one who the out, who were the outsiders, and likewise the Taka people called us the outsiders because we were not within their territory. And this morning I also touch upon this issue and also on the class contradiction. In Takai, not everybody was uh, an enemy. Some were friends as well. As they took side uh, with the revolution. So, in order to analyze the actual details of who the enemy was, we actually had to look at the activities in details, and it is a very complicated issue to do so. And if we were to do it raw, then it would be a danger. Uh, Mr. Witness, it It is, it is correct that you said this morning that in your memory, external enemies refers to enemies outside of the district. But would you be able to remember or would you know that if the revolutionary flag was speaking about external enemies, who they were referring to. The author of an article about external enemies, who was he referring to? Do you know? Response. I'm afraid I don't remember this. It happened a very long time ago. I don't remember it. Maybe, Mr. Witness, if I ask it in a different manner, you, you'll be able to remember. Who was, which, who was the external enemy of the democratic Kampuchea regime in the period 75-79? Could you please repeat that question? Let me help you a little bit, Mr. Witness. Which country do you think, no, no, do you think, which country did the revolutionary flag refer to when, they, when it spoke about external enemies? Response. Yes, uh, outsiders here refer to people abroad and insiders refer to those who were inside Cambodia. And which people, Mr. Witness, abroad were the external enemies, according to the revolutionary flag?
response. I cannot answer this question. Let me help you a little bit, Mr. Witness. Do you remember if the word external enemy was ever used together with Vietnam? Mean. Response. Yes, I'm familiar with this. Uh, uh, Vietnam would be um, relevant to the term outsiders. Very well. Now, do you remember, Mr. Witness, if in these confessions from the civilians, they were ever referring to Vietnam? Were they saying that they working, were working together with Vietnam? Response. No. So you never read the word Vietnam or the threat of Vietnam? in one of these confessions. Is that correct? Mr. Witness, I, I, I see you're not responding. My question was, did you ever read in these confessions of civilians that they were working with, with Vietnam or that they were conspiring together with Vietnam? Or was it only speaking about minor offenses? Response. They were talking about something else, not about Vietnam. Thank you, Mr. Witness. I will move on. In one of your statements, several statements as a matter of fact, you're using the words education and re-education. Would you be able to explain what you mean with the word education and what you mean with the word re-education? Response. The term uh, education and learning are used interchangeably, but re-education means a person should be refashioned or re-educated. So if he or she could not be re-educated, then he or she would be given another opportunity to be re-educated until he or she was refashioned. What is it? correct when I say that before somebody in those days was re-educated, he first was educated? Response. Yes, uh, people would be taken to the study sessions where they would be educated, and in that, in those sessions, uh, people would be educated on how to do good things, right things. 
and if they were not learning well during these education sessions, were they then re-educated? response yes they were if they could not uh, be educated then they could be re-educated and what does re-education mean what would happen during these re-education sessions do you know response. Re-education refers to the sessions where people would be educated uh, to do right things physically and mentally and that uh, if they had committed any wrongdoings then they would be advised or educated to stop doing those things and be the right person. And when the re-education was finished, when they were successful in learning whatever they had to learn during these re-education sessions, do you know what happened afterwards to these people? Response. If a person was successfully re-educated, he or she would then be reintegrated into the society where he could then be assigned some normal tasks. And Mr. Witness, do you know whether this was the case for everybody? Everybody who was successfully re-educated could go back to the place that he or she was coming from? response no it didn't apply to everyone because not everyone was successfully re-educated uh, some could not be re-educated but then had to be re-educated again but, but do you know mr. witness if there was a special distinction between former Lono military who were re-educated or normal civilians who were re-educated. Response. Things were not the same, in particular when it comes to the civilians and soldiers and how they were treated. Could you explain us what the difference was and how you know what the difference was? response I cannot respond to this question can mr. president allow my duty counsel to assist me the president 
Mr. Witness, your counsel can only help you, but not with your response, but with some idea of how to respond to not incriminate yourself in such responses. But it is you who are here to testify based on your memories and uh, experiences. So uh, you say you don't remember things. If you don't, then you just say so. And this question is uh, just a normal question, and you are now instructed to respond to it. The President, Council Kope, you may um, repeat this question because the witness appears to have forgotten it. Mr. Witness, do you know, do you remember if there was a difference between the re-education of former Lono military and the re-education of of uh, normal civilians. Response. I knew something about the re-education of civilians. I had no knowledge of how soldiers would be re-educated, but I believe uh, they too would uh, be um, brought to some educational sessions where they could be educate, re-educated. Uh, and some disappeared. If they disappeared, they disappeared. I don't know how to respond to this because so long as they never uh, return, I could tell that they disappeared. And uh, But more or less in the re-education sessions, people will have to help educate those who need to be re-educated and then one needed to criticize one another for better. My, my question, Mr. Witness, was not about what you believe. It's, my question is, is about what you know. Do you know what happened to military officials who were successfully re-educated? Response. I think sometimes I don't understand parts of your question. That's why I find it difficult to respond fully. Let me try it in other words, Mr. Witness. You have said that not only civilians but also military officials were re-educated. And once the re-education was successful, they were sen sent back to where they came from. Is that correct? Response. Those who were successfully re-educated were seen to have returned to where they belonged originally. Very well, Mr. Witness. Now, based on your knowledge, based on your experience of what happened in 1975, would it be possible that the military who you said disappeared were in fact only sent for re-education and returned to their homes. Um. The President, uh, Mr. Witness, could you please hold on and Mr. Co-Prosecutor, you may now proceed. Uh, that calls for speculation and I object. 
Mr. President, this is only a very small fragment of the speculation that the prosecutor is seeking from this particular witness. So allow me this a little speculation when it comes to this particular topic. It is an important topic. And um, we should be able to discern exactly when this witness is speculating when he's not. The President, uh, Judge Silvercatra, you may now have the floor. Thank you, President. Uh, the President has asked me to rule as follows. Uh, the question is speculative, and of course, Mr. Copy, you have acknowledged that. Uh, if you wish to put a precise question to the witness, such as, did you personally uh, witness any Lon Nol military uh, following re-education who were sent home, then you might have a basis for putting the question. And you cannot overlook the fact that this morning the prosecutors were asking questions based on the um, statement prepared by the Office of Co-Investigating Judges. So there is uh, the, 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 the uh, term speculative cannot be applied to such questions.
Thank you, Judge Cartwright. Um, let me allow me, uh, Mr. President, to, to rephrase the question in another manner. Um, and I will do that as follows, Mr. Witness. Um, I am putting it to you that the military people of whom the wives were speaking in 75 were in fact re-educated and all returned to their homes, correct or not correct? Mr. President, I still object. In order to put the suggestion to a witness, there has to be some evidential foundation for the suggestion that's being put to the witness. Otherwise, we're back in speculation. You can't just say to a witness, I put it to you that this is a certain scenario, unless there's some evidential foundation. That's what speculation goes to. Mr. President, I'm doing exactly the same thing as this same prosecutor was doing in respect of the question in, of Kyuson Pan's wife. There's nothing wrong with putting something to a witness and then ask him to respond. He could say, I don't know. He could say yes. He could say no. I'm not inviting him to speculate now. I'm just putting something to him. If he wants to establish four lies, as I did with Q Sompon's wife, and put the matter, then it's evidentially based. But this is not based on evidence. It's based entirely on speculation. And so I repeat the objection. The President, uh, Council, you can now uh, proceed to a new question, please. With pleasure, Mr. Uh, President. Mr. Witness, um, you have been speaking about a meeting at, uh, at the end of 75, a meeting during which Nguyen Chia has given education lessons. Is that correct? Do you remember saying that? Response. Yes, it is correct. And I rem do remember having said that. Uh, now, could you explain to us how you knew then it was new and Chia speaking to you? Did he introduce himself? Did he say his name? Can you enlighten us on that? Response. He was the head of that school, and I was an ordinary combatant who attended the session as the other participants. So he was the head of that school, and he was known to us. And the policy he introduced in the study sessions was very good, because it was meant to be uh, introduced to people, and they were good uh, education sessions, so I were convinced, uh, interested uh, by the sessions, and uh, we follow what being taught. Well, my question, Mr. Witness, was how did 
this person of whom you are saying it was Nuan Chia, how did he introduce himself? What did he say was his name? Response. He never appeared before us introducing himself because uh, during each uh, study session he would just teach us and we regarded him as Om or Grand Uncle. That's the way we addressed him and the way he was known. And again, there was no time that he would introduce himself and his role. But, but how did you know at the time it was new and Chia? I simply knew he was. Now you also spoke about Pol Pot addressing the session during which 800 people had gathered. How do you know now, or how did you know then, it was in fact a person called Pol Pot? That was speaking. No, I did not uh, say that. I confirmed that actually Om Noon or Uncle Noon, who actually taught uh, throughout the training session, and uh, there was a session conducted prior to my session. I don't, I don't have the transcript in front of me of what was said this morning, Mr. Witness, but I do recall you saying, you testifying, that also Pol Pot spoke during this meeting. Are, are you now withdrawing that? No, I did not say that this morning. President, the prosecution, you may proceed. Oh, it's only to, to help my learned friend because we did take a note this morning. Uh, and what the witness said was that there had been a prior session where Pol Pot had been involved. Um, uh, as the first session not the second one which Nguyen Chia was involved in. So we have the note, and the witness did not say that Pol Pot was involved in this session. It was the previous session. Very well. No, 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 no problem, um, Mr. President. When you saw, Mr. Witness, Pol Pot at this session, um, how did you know it was Pol Pot speaking to the people who were listening? I couldn't get your question. The council, please uh, repeat your question. You have been speaking, Mr. Witness, this morning about a meeting, an education meeting, during which Nguyen Chia was present. And the prosecutor just helped me 
by saying that prior to that meeting, there was a meeting during which Pol Pot was speaking. And my question to you is how did you know that it was in fact Pol Pot who was speaking? Allow me to clarify that uh, my study session was uh, conducted by Uncle Noon. He was the second person, and that was the second session. And there was a session prior to my session. So it was likely that in the prior session, And I just like to to say that in the first session it was Pol Pot because it was for the top people. Because in the first uh, training session only those uh, sector and zone secretaries attended the study session. That is all. Well, my question, Mr. Witness, is how you knew at that time it was Pol Pot who was speaking to these top cadres. No, I did not know. And can you explain to us how you knew that Nguyen Chia, or Uncle Nguyen, was in fact the number two of the Khmer Rouge. Did you hear that there? How did that come to you? about it uh, through my study sessions and through the exchange of uh, work and through other people. They talk about the position of this uh, uncle or that uncle. As you may know, the water would seep down from the top of the mountain to the base of the mountain and uh, that kind of a flow of water cannot be stopped. So we all know about the position of those ankles. Mr. So I knew the names of those ankles, and that is the fact. We were talking about December 1975, Mr. Witness. Are you sure? that you heard then that Uncle Nguyen was number two? Isn't it true, Mr. Witness, that the whole country didn't know about Pol Pot Nguyen Chia or about Pol Pot until somewhere far in 1977? Nobody knew about uh, the true natures of those people prior to the liberation. We only knew of the party and Onka. But after the war ended, we knew the real people behind uh, those names. And especially when we came uh, to engage in the study session, we learned about it. We just simply knew when we were there. We knew the first ankle or the second ankle, for instance. And that is all.
And in fact, I did not ask anyone about uh, who the person was. But of course, when I started with him, I knew who he was. It is my understanding that when you ask for the method, just the arrangement of the seats, we would knew, we would know who is the, the chairman or the president of that uh, meeting. There is no need for the announcement of uh, the, the chairman of the meeting, for instance. But, Mr. Witness, I'm sure you went home after these sessions. Do you remember being excited, telling that you knew that the number one was in fact Pol Pop and the rest of the country still didn't know that? Did you tell anybody that? There was no announcement. I was participant in the second study session and I studied with the uh, uncle. Maybe you did, Mr. Witness, who knows? But would it be possible that you were wrong in the date of the education session? That it would rather be at the end of 77 than the end of 75. President, uh, witness, please observe the microphone first. Witness. Allow me to correct it. It was not in 1975, but it was in late 1976 when I studied with him. President, thank you, Mr. Witness and Defense Council. We will have a 20 minute break now and we shall return at 3 p.m. Court officer, could you assist the witness during the break and have him return to the courtroom at 3 p.m.? Likewise, it uh, applies for the duty council. The court is now in recess.